welcome to Reading Aloud, the programme about books for you and the children you teach. This week, an intriguing question. How truthful does historical fiction have to be? Coming up, young readers put pen to paper and tackle an author. Put like for a suggestion as well. Livy Michael's mysterious tale of disappearing children. As soon as I heard the story, I knew I wanted to tell it. Just why have we stopped using libraries? Do you ever use a library? No, I don't. And our panel reads Frank McCourt's Teacher Man. Historical fiction is enjoying a huge boost in popularity at the moment, though some critics are a little bit snooty about it, condemning it as lowbrow stuff, neither good fiction nor good history. Well, we'll be tackling that question of historical accuracy in a moment. But first, let's meet a very successful writer working in the genre, Sally Gardner, winner of the Nestle Children's Fiction Award with her book, I, Coriander. The winner of the Nestle Children's Book Prize Gold Medal is I, Coriander by Sally Gardner. The award will no doubt secure further sales of this story of a young girl set in the time of Oliver Cromwell. It's a fantasy adventure firmly rooted amongst real historical events. I have always been riveted by London, what London might have looked like in the 17th century. And I thought of the bridge, London Bridge. And I think that most probably was one of the eighth wonders of the world when it was in, in its heyday. Mm. And I thought I'd love to do a story that had that bridge as the centre point of it between two worlds, the world of a Puritan England lacking of imagination and a world of imagination and the fairies. Yes. The award was a remarkable achievement for a dyslexic author who didn't learn to read until she was 14. However, she always loved being read to. Oh, reading aloud, heaven on a stick. I mean, as a child, I couldn't get enough of people reading aloud. Uh, and I think today, now, children are so lucky with all these books on tapes. And I had just the best experience because Coriander's been read on a tape and Juliet Stevens read it and it was just, I thought, this is heaven. This is my idea of heaven, sitting and listening to your story being read to you in that beautiful voice. My name is Coriander Hobie. The book has provided some fascinating work for these Year 8 students at Earls High School. In the year of our Lord, 1643. It is just a stone's throw from London Bridge, with a river running past the windows at the back. To the front is my mother's once beautiful walled garden that leads through a wooden door out onto the bustling city street. Is this an historical story? Why? Why not? But this isn't an English class. It's history with a twist. So we started off by uh, looking at what are the characteristics of a good piece of fiction? What are the characteristics of a good piece of history? And I think that got across to the students that, yes, in good historical fiction, you, you will see a lot of imagination. You will, you will see um, the author having a licence to invent. But you would also see some genuine historical scholarship. So that's what we set out to find. So that London Frost there, that's our source one. Let's picture one. Then we got on to the bit about the frost there. Yeah, it's like a diary, isn't it? What, what happens? And that like, threw up some interesting things from the students. He's frozen and stuff. The really good historians amongst you should see that she's invented a few things as well. See if you can find out what it is. They found extracts from John Evelyn's diary that uh, described the, the weather conditions and how cold it was and, and, and the Thames freeze and all that. And he also describes the frost there in, in quite a lot of detail. Is it likely? That that's going to be true in a diary? Um, yeah, because if it's in a diary at that time, it will be written down what happened. There's also this lovely engraving of the frost there. But the dates are 1684. And Sally's setting for the frost there is 1649. And see if the setting for Sally's book is the same date. So then it leads to the question, as she invented this, and so the students were looking at that. Dear Sally Gardner, we have read act extracts from your book, I Coriander, during our history lesson. We like the way you have blended history with fiction. The students then wrote letters to the author with their own thoughts on the book. Sources. 
Reading your novel as a historian and as a linguist gives two different impressions of your story. On the one hand, the historical authenticity could be improved. Um, on the other, an author ought to be granted some artistic license as a means to grab the reader and transport them to something new and not simply to the pages of the textbook. That's incredible. Uh, that's uh, really nice. And then that's the way she ends that letter to, to Sally. A library, books, reading. Trouble is, fewer and fewer people are going to them. Do you ever use a library? No, I don't. Um, no, I don't actually. No, really, no. 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 How about you? No, I don't use it yet. There's no need. Why is that? Do you think? Uh, to buy all the books that I want to read. If I go to the library, it's just probably to use the internet, use the computers, and that. So libraries have got to change, but how? Some people say, well, what you've got to do is you've got to bring in CDs, DVDs, computers, maybe a cafe or a dance studio or massage even. Some people say, uh-uh, no, the problem is the name. You can't call them libraries. You've got to call them something new like uh, a discovery centre or an idea store. And other people say, no, the problem is where libraries are. So maybe you put it next to a supermarket or in supermarkets. Well, I'm in favour of opening the whole thing up. Put books at the very centre of modern entertainment. After all, we live in what's called an intermediate world. We shunt between the different media. One minute, listening to the radio, next, watching TV, reading a newspaper, getting on the computer and reading books. Intermediate. Now, I do think that some of the finest and greatest things ever written are to be found in books and only in books. But so long as the punters are on the outside, they may never discover that. But get them through the door, and they just might. Now, let's return to historical fiction with writer Livy Michael. Her book, Whispering Road, was nominated for the Nestle Prize. And when we met up, she told me all about it. The book is actually about a true story about something that happened close to where I live, which is that the, a farmer and his wife took two children from the workhouse uh, to work on the farm, and the years went by, and people gradually realised that the children weren't getting any older. And only when the mother of one of them came looking for a daughter was it discovered that the farmer and his wife had been working the children to death and replacing them with similar-looking children from different workhouses. Do you think it's a book that's been read in both English and history lessons? Well, I think uh, the audience is mainly secondary school age, I think. I'm not sure that it's actually a curriculum book, but um, more and more children are writing to me because they've, um, they're doing things on the workhouse, yes, so it's got that aspect to it, yes. From historical fiction to personal memoir. This week, our panel have been reading Frank McCourt's Teacher Man. The writer of the international bestseller Angela's Ashes details his illustrious, amusing, and sometimes rather rocky years as an English teacher in New York's public high schools. Here they come, and I'm not ready. How could I be? I'm a new teacher and learning on the job. The door slams against the shelf that runs along the base of the blackboard, stirs a cloud of chalk dust. Entering a room is a big deal. Why couldn't they simply walk into a room, say, good morning and sit? Oh no, they have to push and jostle. One says, hey, in a mock threatening way, and another one says, hey, right back. They insult one another, ignore the late bell, take their time sitting. That's cool, baby. Look, there's a new teacher up there, and new teachers don't know shit. So, bell, teacher, new guy. Who is he? Who cares?
So, Frank McCourt's first day of teaching. Anything like your first day, Grant? Well, Frank McCourt is, of course, teaching in a sort of New York City high school and it's challenging and it's tough and it's very multicultural. And I was uh, actually, my first day of teaching was in a pretty dozy Suffolk middle school. And, um, and I, the kids were very, very polite. And especially at the end of the day, when I had my first PE lesson and the year eight lads all lined up outside the shed and they said, and I said, right, I've got the key lads and I'll go and I'll get the footballs out. And I, they said, well, I said, no, they said I'll, I'll do it for you, sir. And so he unlocked the door, opened the door, and like the sort of greenhorn I was, I walked in and he shut the door and, and he locked it. <laughs> <laughs> so in so way, there was I similar. in the shed. <laughs> yes. And all my kids the other side of the shed and he had the key. So, you know, I think there's a sort of universality <laughs> about kids and about first days of teaching. And it's all about fear and naivety and and how you get caught and that sense of you against them, you know, mm. there's, there's one of you and there's 30 or 35 of them. And that for me was a real universal. All of which is, which is in the book. Now, do we think reading this book that Frank McCourt was a good teacher? Can we discern that from the book? Uh, I, have, I have mixed, mixed ideas about that, actually, because I, I'm a literacy strategy and, and all quite formulaic. I was trained in that way. And Frank McCourt is obviously a storyteller and that's the way that he teaches. Uh, and it takes him a while to actually find his, his style and, and the, the way of teaching that he's comfortable with, but it works for him. And I'm sure that the children he taught got a lot out of it. I think there were some examples of good teaching. I thought the thing of it, when he picked up on um, the excuse notes, when he suddenly realised that they could all write these incredibly purple excuse notes, but they wouldn't write anything else for him. Um, and then he used that as a method of getting them yeah. to do some writing. I thought that was an example that actually he could be a good teacher. Um, but I think it's such a self-indulgent memoir in a sense that it's so much talking about what he felt and not what he did. It's hard to know whether he was a good teacher. And it made me want to maybe want to teach, you know, reading it. Yeah, it I think it was, wanna... it was quite positive about teaching, even though there were so many awkward Terrible moments things. for him. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was something that he felt he could now share because of the success of Angela's Ashes. Mm. That he could now draw on some of his other experiences and put something else out there for us to, to relate to. Did you, uh, at any point reading the book, think, oh, well, maybe I could modify my practice in a certain way. I mean, maybe I could give this a try. Maybe if some kid threw a sandwich on the floor, you know, I might pick it up and eat it. <laughs> no, but I too. think it's nice for NQTs, for new teachers coming into the profession, to sort of see that, you know, after a number of years, you can still be feeling this sort of way. Whenever you go into a new school, you'll still feel a little bit of, a little bit of fear, and at the start of each new term, you'll still feel a little bit afraid of what sort of relationship you're going to get from these kids. In some ways, a book of moments, Julia. Any one moment that stood out for you? Yes, there's a moment when he's teaching in the university, he's frightfully proud to be in a university, and then the head says to him, I could keep you on, um, even though you haven't got a PhD, if you can just tell me that you're studying for one. What are you studying for? And he says, I'm not studying for anything at all. And he realises he doesn't want to. And I like that because it shows that our obsession with overqualification isn't something new. These things have happened before. That's it for Reading Aloud. Just time to share with you one of my favourite but anonymous quotes about the value of teaching. I think it may have come out of a cracker. A good teacher is like a candle. It consumes itself to light the way for others. Ooh, bye.